a bit of background. I've recently been interested in the parables and uh, after quite a lot of work, I decided that I'd summarise my thoughts on one of the parables and write it down in the form of a sermon. I made the mistake of telling Alison what I'd done and as a result of conversations with her, here I am. And so you now have the chance of witnessing something quite remarkable, the spectacle of an old dog doing a new trick. The text for today is the gospel from Matthew's account of the parable of the sower. The story is also found in Mark 4, in Luke 8, and in the gospel of Thomas. But I will only refer to Matthew. Most scholars argue that, Matthew wrote, that Mark wrote the first gospel, and that in the case of the parables, Matthew copied him almost word for word. I prepared this sermon using the NIV Study Bible, and as a result, my quotes will sound very different from the paraphrase we heard read. For example, I'll talk about the kingdom of God, whereas Nathan talks about the God's culture. I'm more familiar with the former phrase and think the latter sounds more like a modern day influencer working their magic on Facebook. So let's summarize the parable. At the end of Matthew chapter 12, Jesus turns his back on his family and turning towards to face the crowd, starts using parables to teach them about the kingdom of God. The first of these is about the farmer who went out to sow. The story is very simple and is built on contrasting triplets. First, we have three inhospitable environments where the seed fails, hard ground, rocks and weeds. And then we have three good environments where the seed flourishes, some 100 fold, some 60, some 30 fold. The point of the story seems very simple. Seed in, hot, in inhospitable places produces nothing, while seed in good soil produces abundantly. This image of the Palestinian peasants scattering seed was so evocative that the British and Foreign Bible Society adopted it as their logo. It's a romantic image of a subsistence farmer dressed in a simple cloak and a pair of sandals with a satchel over his shoulder and his arm flung wide as he scatters the seed. A common enough sight for Jesus as he travelled around Galilee. No big deal, just a man trying to make a living. Yet Jesus used it as an image of the kingdom of God. Now, how does that add up? How does scattering seed about or feeding your family equate with the kingdom of God? The crowd, though impressed, were puzzled. But the disciples didn't have a clue. So when they're away from the crowds, they asked him, why do you preach in parables? We don't understand. So Jesus explained it to them. And this is in Matthew 13, 18 to 23. And this reading will be from the NIV study Bible. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom of God and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed along the path. So the seed is the news about the kingdom of God, sown in a person's heart. If they don't understand it, they don't give it a second thought. It remains exposed and the birds, the evil one, eat it up, disappears without a trace and comes to nothing. So when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, listen up. You have ears. Use them. Try to understand what he's saying. The one that received the seed that fell on rocky places is a man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. This is like a young Christian who received the news about God's kingdom with enormous enthusiasm. But the response is superficial, has no deep roots. And when trouble comes, it ends in tears. It comes to nothing. So put down roots. The one who receives the seed that fell among thorns is a man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, 
making it unfruitful. These people are far too busy making money or worried about their kids to pay attention to news about the kingdom. Their priorities lie elsewhere. They're too busy to put their trust in God or strengthen their bonds with the people of God. And again, it comes to nothing. So think about what's important in life and beware of weeds. But the one who receives the seed that fell on good soil is a man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop, yielding 100, 60, or 30 times what was sown. So understanding is a key to producing an abundant yield. First century Palestinian farmers may have never heard of DNA or double helixes, but they are well aware of breed, that wheat breeds true. The grain that was sown was good news about the kingdom of God. It will produce more good seed. That is more good news about the kingdom of God. The good news will no more produce scandals and divisions than wheat will produce pumpkins. The grain that failed did not fail because it was bad grain. It failed because of where it was. In good conditions, it will always breed true. The farmer in the story wanted to feed his family, but Australian farmers boast that they want to feed the world. And even though farming practices have changed, they still have to contend with fields that are compacted with compacted ground, fields littered with rocks, and fields infested with weeds. The difference is that farmers now prepare the land before seeding. They fence the paddocks to keep out the roos and use heavy machinery to plough the hard packed soil and loosen it up, clear the fields of rock, reducing them to dust, and apply herbicides to kill the weeds. Then, with the first rains of winter, they start circling day and night, planting the crop from the comfort of their air-conditioned cabs. In the first century, the farmers spread the good news by hand. Today, we use heavy machinery and work on a completely different scale. Similarly, we work on a completely different scale when preaching. So how do we scatter the seed in our churches? We use microphones, a device that with the power to scatter the seed far beyond anything a first century Palestinian could ever have imagined. Never trivialize its power, so praise for those who use it, isolated pastors serving tiny congregations in remote locations, teams of pastors serving large megachurches, or those involved in cross-cultural ministries whom we so often forget. Pray for them all, that they may preach faithfully and never be seduced by the power of their office or abuse their authority. Apart from the televangelists, there are very few preachers who preach to all and sundry. A long time since I saw a preacher first on the soapbox haranguing the crowds down at South Bank. Today's preachers fence their fields by building chapels, halls and auditorium and preach the gathered faithful, either in the building or online. And unlike the sower of old, they prepare the fields, working hard to remove the obstacles to faith. They break up hard ground, they remove rocks, they destroy weeds. Let me illustrate. Today, some preachers will be tackling some very hard ground, our indifference to pressing social issues. They may be preaching about the voice to parliament or the plight of refugees, and they will go round and round trying to soften people's hearts. Like a, like a road worker with a jackhammer, breaking up asphalt, or a podiatrist attacking a bunion, they'll be vigorously trying to remove calluses. They'll do this so that we can hear the cries of the oppressed, see our history in a new light, and understand the injustices on which our society has been built. Other preachers will be tackling rocky ground. They will, preach in, they will preach to those whose faith is shallow, dealing with the foundations of our faith, encouraging people to put down deep roots so that everyone has a strength to endure trouble and persecution. And still others will be attacking weeds, affirming the goodness of God and the reality of his love, re reassuring those who are weighed down by the worries of this world, and confronting those whose love of money blinds them to the kingdom of God. 
They'll be debunking the claim that retail therapies are solution to all our problems or reaching out to those addicted to gambling. Like a crop duster roaring over the heads of the congregation, the words will echo up and down the aisles, leaving an uncomfortable fog in the still air and an unpleasant taste in the mouth of their hearers. All these will be preparing the ground for the good news, so that when preached, it will fall onto good soil and produce abundantly, some 30 times, some 60 times, some 100 times the amount of sown. Enough to feed the world. As the seed produces a plant, so the good news about the kingdom of God produces disciples. And as the mature plant produces more seed, so mature disciples preach the word far and wide. And while discussing things botanical, a seed is a good food source because it's a small packet of energy, full of starch. But each seed is small and only has enough energy to produce a tiny plant with a small root and two round seed leaves. Remember your first science lessons in primary school when you tried to grow some seeds on cotton wool in a saucer of water? When kept in the dark, the Seeds produced long, white, spindly stem and used up all their energy trying to get light. But when placed in sunlight, they turned green and started to photosynthesize and grew into fully formed plant with stems and leaves. So plants grow when they're exposed to sunlight. Similarly, we grow when we're exposed to God's love. Thus, here at South Yarra, let us live as the people of God and reflect to the culture of God's kingdom by proclaiming the good news, by making disciples of all peoples and nurturing each other with demonstrations of love. So listen carefully. What is the kingdom of God like? Kingdom of God is like a farmer who went out to sow. Some seed fell on hard ground and produced nothing. Some fell on rocky places and produced nothing. Some in weed infested areas and produced nothing, but some fell on good soil, where it produced 30 fold, which was sown, some 60 fold, and some 100 fold, that which was sown. Let those who have, have ears to hear, hear.